Okay, it's time. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to join Star Remote Sensing for Environmental Monitoring. Today's lecture is Dr. Yunong Lin. She is from Institute of Earth Science Academia Sinica. And her research interests are in sharp processing, time series analysis, reflection seismology, and uh, velocity model building. Okay, Natalie, please. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you find the previous training session useful to you. And if you uh, didn't really catch up during the previous session, um, I hope you had tried uh, by yourself between uh, last session and now. Okay. So today, uh, as promised before, I'm going to continue on uh, from the previous uh, slide. And then uh, I think there are a few more like uh, mini sessions uh, in the in, uh, inside related topic and operations. Afterwards, we will uh, switch gear to talk about flood mapping. And uh, I would like to later, I will probably start again from a small hands on session, because by doing hands on, it's probably easier for you to understand what exactly I'm talking about. And finally, I will give a, a short talk about the recent uh, development in uh, using SAR to uh, to map floods. Okay, so uh, before uh, we start the hands-on, okay, uh, if you still remember last time when we end, we are at exactly at this uh, point where we have unwrapped the interferogram. Okay, of course the unwrapping process is not very straightforward in SNAP because you need to go through, uh, if you still remember, the, uh, the Linux on Windows okay, to, to do the unwrapping. Okay. Uh, some people emailed me about uh, more details, and I hope you have already managed to finish. Okay. You have managed to do the unwrapping. Okay. And to some, of you, to some of you, you may feel like, oh, we have already finished unwrapping. Does it mean it's already the end? Well, not really. So let's move on to the following um, practices. Uh, and the last time here, okay, so here, last time we end with this final product called UNWIFG, okay? So I'm going to move on to open snap, okay? Hope you're with me. And let's open the product. Last time we finished. Go up. Okay, so these are all the previous, some of them are the previous products that we generated uh, throughout the practice. And the product I believe we generate through our wrapping is called UNWIFG. And if you like it, you can also open the, the filtered, which is the one before our wrapping. Okay, so maybe let me start with this one. Okay, and let's have a look again, just a, you know, a review of what we did last time. So we have this beautiful face okay, with all these fringes, concentric circles, and then we carry out the unwrapping. Okay. And then in this final product, we have this UNW face that stands for the unwrapped face. Let's have a look. All right. So it's cool that we have this uh, unwrapped phase. So now I will start from uh, session 11 on the October 17th uh, PPT, okay? Phase two displacement. All right. So uh, I think this, there is a little bit of uh, terminology here, okay? Uh, and the previous, I didn't realize that exactly in SNAP, when it means phase, it seems to be indicating that the value is from uh, satellite ground, okay? Whereas when we say displacement in SNAP, it seems to indicate the value is <clears throat> from a different reference point. It's from ground to satellite, okay? So you may wonder what that means. It sounds very confusing. So uh, let's first look at the, okay, I'm, going, I'm at uh, uh, slide 11.2, okay? We want to check the pixel values. All right, so now we're at the unwrapped phase. 
let's go to the upper left hand side there is a pixel value and then we move the cursor up here okay so the value is in the bands okay right here and you can see this blue color has a value called like a, something like a 30 30 ish okay and the uh, the comments next to the value says is the absolute phase okay something like that <clears throat> so you some people actually ask what does the value mean and because it is still in phase and when we talk about the phase of a radio uh, of an electromagnetic wave it usually means the value is between 0 and 2 pi or negative pi to positive pi depending on how you describe it so the unit of this phase is radians, okay? All right, so there is a value of like a 30 something radians. And then uh, here at the lower, lower part, you can actually uh, use your wheel to zoom in and use your, uh, okay. So use the middle wheel to zoom in and use your right click and drag to move it to Taiwan okay, so that you can have a look at where exactly is the image on the right window located. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> this red box is where this image is located. Although you may feel, oh, they look a bit different in orientation because this one looks like some kind of a uh, Cartesian coordinates, whereas the one on the lower left window seems to be a little bit oriented. Okay. All right. So let's move on to uh, 11.3. So let me quickly show the window. Okay. So here I'm showing some research that we have already done on this area, okay, regarding this earthquake. So what you have seen in the in the interferogram, actually in, we have also obtained many GPS observation. So for a, a lecturing purpose, I'm telling you that according to the GPS, uh, this area is actually seeing some uh, horizontal motion like this one is showing here, okay? as well as vertical motion okay it's predominantly vertical and the west west uh, movement okay and then here i'm plotting the so-called the line of sight direction which means that uh, uh, because we're looking at the ascending which means it's flying toward the north okay the ascending flight so and the satellite is looking to the right so the line of sight direction as plotted here is actually this one and you have to remember whenever you see this line of sight direction plotted like this is actually some indication that this vector is from the satellite, which is the center of this intersection, to the ground. Okay, so the line of sight direction plotted here means it's from satellite to the ground. All right, but anyway, the value in the middle is positive value. So you can imagine that if we consider it's looking from satellite to the ground, when the ground is moving up, okay, when the ground is moving to the west, which means it's moving to the satellite, right? So you're supposed to see some value that's representing the decrease between the decrease of this distance between the satellite and the ground, okay? So supposedly what you're seeing here need to be a negative value. Okay, because the distance between the satellite to the ground is already negative, okay, is already decreasing due to the ground motion of this location. But how come we're seeing positive in this case? Okay, there are actually a few confusing factors, which is, can be very, very confusing. <laughs> okay, so I'm listing three factors that will impact the interpretation of the INSAR that you obtained. The first one is whether if the interfer this unwrapped interferogram you obtained, is that at a satellite to ground 
reference frame or a ground to satellite reference frame. Okay. And you may ask, how am I supposed to know? Okay. The answer is, well, it's not easy to know because sometimes in, internally in different processing softwares, they internally flip the sign. Okay. Because supposedly when you do all the row operation or calculation on the original data, what you're supposed to see is the satellite to the ground, right? Because every measurement is done on the satellite. So presumably you should see satellite to ground. But the problem is that some of the processing software, not necessarily SNAP, but also like ICE or GMT SAR, some of them may internally flip the sign for you, okay? And that always causes confusion. So unless you are very familiar with the sign, of the software that you're using. The sign here, I mean satellite to ground or ground to satellite. Otherwise, uh, is you cannot always assume it is satellite to ground or ground to satellite. That means you, you will need to uh, use some kind of a ground measurement <laughs> to validate, all right? So that is the first factor that may cause the confusion. The second factor is when you do the when you produce the interferogram, are you doing the post-event minus the pre-event? Or the pre-event minus the post-event? Okay, so these will be another sign confusion because some of the SAR processing software, they are doing post minus pre, okay, or later dates minus the earlier dates. Whereas some other, they do the sign, the, the earlier date minus the later date, okay? So as you can imagine, this will be another sign flipping, depending on how you do it, okay? And of course here, I'm, if you still remember, but I'm just telling you here directly that in this operation, in this exercise, we're doing the post minus pre, okay? And what you're seeing now is a positive, okay? Uh -oh, hold on, let me, let me continue, continue on with the third factor. Okay, the third factor is not really that much affecting the sign, okay? Because it's just an absolute versus relative, okay? So uh, this, the important information from here is that the observation from INSAR is always a relative value, okay? That means if you compare your observation with your GPS observation, okay, like this one, okay? So these are the GPS, and we know GPS are the absolute deformation. But INSAR is not absolute. So when you do the, when you final, finally produce this, there will be always a reference, okay? And then you may ask, no, I didn't set up the reference when I uh, carry out the unwrapping, okay? So basically it's reference to some kind of, I think some kind of average value, okay? But it, when, when it's reference to average value, that means the value, the deformation you're seeing in your INSAR and the, the true absolute deformation may have some kind of static offset, okay? So usually you will not be able to uniquely constrain the static offset unless you have ground measurements. Okay, so if you want to really know what exactly is the absolute value here, you will need to have at least one ground measurement. Okay, of course the best is two or even more. All right, so just need to remember all these confusion factors. One is that how is your data processed in the software? Is that satellite to ground or ground to satellite? And is that later date minus earlier date or vice versa? And you need to remember your observation from inside is only relative. So from all different perspectives of uh, inside measurement, unfortunately, uh, usually when I, for example, if I uh, see an earthquake happened in Taiwan and I produce an interferogram, I will need to separately find some validation points to check what's the exactly sign of this pattern. So there are two ways. The first is that you're lucky you have ground measurements from INSAR. So you check the measurements from INSAR and compare with this, the value you see, okay, 
you come sorry you compare the value from GPS with the value you see from INSA and you can confirm whether it, the sign that you're seeing here is correct or not okay that is the first method the second method which is um, if you don't have any ground measurements at this location okay what you can do instead is that you can go and pull out or to process a separate event for example this one which is a separate event different from the the, the, the for example a recent earthquake I'm looking at and then this event you already know what's the correct sign all right for example you know the correct sign of this one need to be multiplied with a negative one negative one for example then you know in your current observation you also need to multiply with a negative one okay so the reason why I'm saying uh, it's better to always validate by using ground measurements or by using an earlier event is because you cannot guarantee that you remember the sign correctly and you cannot guarantee that the people who provide you the INSAR knows the sign correctly or and you are using a different software uh, from the one that you used to use before okay so there are so many different factors that can come that can confuse that can confuse the sign of your interferogram so it's always a safer practice that you separately validate the sign of your interferogram okay please remember this is very important all right so now let's uh, just continue on to sorry Back to the, the hands-on practice but anyway we know currently following the processing chain that I showed you previously what we have obtained the value here is uh, positive so if I continue with the practice in snap which is that you go to radar okay so I'm in 11.5 okay slide 11.5 radar interferometric okay products phase to displacement so let's just do this okay so the input you need to use the UNW IFG okay and I here yeah, what I put is CM okay. and folder is project Taiwan okay uh, you don't need to do anything here so let's try run All right, so let's go back to product. Now I have my UNW IFG in CM. Okay, and now let's go back to and check the pixel value. Oh, sorry, it's actually meter, it's not centimeter. Okay, sorry, it says it's meter next to it. So you immediately observe that previously what used to be positive value in your face okay positive value in the center has been turned into negative value okay so this may be confusing to you but it's actually just because in snap it assumes that you need to flip the sign for you okay however I think this is a bit dangerous because uh, snap doesn't really know what is the sign of the dates that the user used okay whether if you do the earlier minus later or a later minus earlier okay so as I mentioned when it automatically flip the sign for you you may feel totally confused exactly am I seeing an uplift or am I seeing a subsidence all right okay so uh, this is just let you know the uh, the practice that we just did internally here in the radar interferometric product okay this one phase to displacement it's actually flipping the sign for you okay so if you don't really like this to happen here's another way that you can do it so let's do that manually okay I actually like to do things manually because this way it also allows you to uh, learn how exactly you can turn the phase into displacement Okay, so here I'm at 11.7. .7.
convert to displacement by bend math. Okay. So go to raster and bend math right here. So the target products, uh, let's also choose uh, this one, all right? Is that correct? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. OK. So let's uh, change the name to UNW face CM. OK. Of course, you can add something like a menu, OK? which tells you that, okay, so the output is a manual, manually converted value, okay. And uh, we need to uncheck the virtual option, okay, so that uh, the data will be actually saved into this uh, product. Otherwise, it will be only computed in the, in the temporary memory, okay. It's not going to be saved in the actual, in the actual band. Next, let's go to edit expression. Okay. Oh, sorry. I take my words back. Here you need to choose UNW IFG, the one. Okay. I think there's a uh, typo. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yes. Okay. So the target product, the, actually, the input product is UNW IFG. Okay. So edit expression. So now in the UNW IFG, we have all this uh, data sources. So let's choose the one which is the unwrapped phase, okay? And then, so the equation for you to convert the phase into displacement is that you need to multiply by using the wavelength, the radar wavelength. And here we're using C-band. So the wavelength is somewhere around 5.6 or 5.55 centimeter, okay? This is the wavelength for C-band, okay? And then because we're turning the value from uh, 2 pi radians, 2 centimeter. So we are supposed to divide by 2 and the pi, okay, capital PI. But remember, because what the radar measure, measures is the two-way travel time from the satellite to the ground and back to the satellite. So whatever radians you measure, you're, you, you're seeing, need to be further divided by 2, okay? So the two, the factor of two need to become four, all right? So that goes to the equation that you're seeing in the slide. You take the unwrapped phase and the original unit is radians. You multiply with the, cent the wavelengths of the radar and divide by two pi, the two pi radians, and divide by another two, factor of two, representing the two-way travel time. Okay, you hit okay, all right? So if there's no further question, okay, regarding how you do that. So it, exactly in the previous operation, the, the phase two displacement is that they are doing exactly the same thing, but they multiply another negative one for you, okay? The, it flips the, the sign for you, okay? But actually in our case, we don't really need to flip the sign. Okay? So, all right. Okay, so the output goes to the original UNW IFG band. Okay, so let's, okay, it's right here. And we can change the color, okay, I'm in slide 11.8. Okay, color. All right, so if you ac accidentally have the value log 10 clicked, make sure to unclick, okay, because in the displacement in centimeter, we don't really want to see them in the log 10 scale, okay. And for the scheme, we can just can just change the palette to oops. All right, oops. Okay, so we change it to uh, some kind of rainbow color, and then let's change the value to, I think what I put is like minus five to 25, 20. All right, so that's here where you, that's what you're seeing, okay? This color, is already, let's check the pixel value, is already in centimeter, although the here the comment still shows absolute phase, but you know it's already turned into centimeters. Oh, 
sorry. So the absolute phase is the, the, the previous, sorry, is the previous uh, channel, the one without converting to displacement. And then below, the one without, uh, without the unit is actually in centimeter, okay? So this one. So you can compare the values. When the radians used to be like a 30 something, okay? 31, for example, and the displacement in centimeter is like a uh, 14, okay? So this is the way that most uh, radar scientists convert the um, phase into displacement. They actually like to, uh, or we actually like to independently validate the sign of the uh, data that we're seeing. And then we manually convert the phase into displacement by using the, um, the radar wavelengths and also the two-way travel time, okay? All right, so uh, this can be confusing, I know, okay? But just let you know that uh, you don't actually need to bother trying to fix, try to figure out in the software that you're using exactly what's the convention, okay? It should be plus minus, uh, should be set satellite to ground or ground to satellite, or it should be uh, first day minus the second day or the second day minus the first day. The, the best way is always to validate using ground data or using a, a event that you already know the correct sign. Okay, any question? How can we put the exact line of sign sign? Well, the one that we are, that I'm showing, okay, on the PowerPoint, is already the sign that most people are seeing, okay? And you may feel strange because it, it is actually the sign from satellite to ground. But you know, it, because in the, in the radar convention, we always put it this way because uh, we have the flight direction and then we know it's right looking. So if you put the other way around, people will get even more confused. So still please do the satellite to ground convention, but uh, you will need to know the value you're seeing should be the uh, ground to satellite. Okay, so it's actually the opposite sign to the satellite to ground value. Okay, I know this is confu confusing. Uh, what the meaning of the LI? Oh, sorry, yeah, I didn't mention, sorry. Uh, this is the flight direction, okay, how the satellite flies, and this is the look direction, okay, and because radar is only, most radar satellites are looking to the right, so that's how you're looking at. But of course, uh, some of the satellites are left looking. So you really need to be very careful when you obtain the data. You need to double check whether if it's looking to the right or to the left. If the line of sight and flight path direction storing standard one data, if yes, which part of the metadata can I find it? Um, I think it is uh, in, There are a lot of uh, metadata uh, for like a, these are all XML files actually. So if you double check, there are a lot of information that you can uh, see from here. And uh, for example, you can see the near angle, the near incidence angle, the far incidence angle, okay, 30 to 36 degree. And uh, let me see. Okay, you can even find the range spacing and azimuth spacing, okay, of your data. Um, there are simply too many of them. <laughs> okay, here you go, the heading, okay, the central heading. So the heading is like a three, four, nine. So this value is clockwise from zero to the north, okay? So three, four, nine actually means negative 11 degree from north, okay? So that's agreeable with the ascending flight path. And uh, as for the look direction, let me quickly check. Uh, all right, so, all right, of course it says ascending. Right here, oh, here you go, and then not pointing, okay? So I hope it's all clear that uh, of course, this is the benefit of SNAP, 
that it actually pulls out all the data uh, and put them into this uh, metadata XML file for easier for you to, uh, to find the information. Uh, if you are using other softwares uh, like a uh, like a GMT star or ICE, uh, to be honest, uh, it's actually not this straightforward. Okay, uh, the the information can be can be placed everywhere in different kind of log data. Okay, so that's really one thing uh, that I think Snap really you know wins over all the other processing software, which is that it makes the user. It gives the user easy access to all the information. Okay. Any more question? Okay. So if not, I hope you already know where to find the information you need. Okay. What is the difference between unwrapping? Oh, so unwrapping is so the quick answer is let's just ch check the one before unwrapping. So this is the, the data, okay, if you still remember, before unwrapping. And let's look at the pixel value. You will see that the value is always between 2 pi and pi, okay, like that. All right, if you see the value on the bands, it's always uh, negative, two, negative pi to pi and negative pi to pi, okay, which means it's negative 3.14 to positive 3.14. So when you pass one fringe, you pass to another cycle. So um, if I quickly uh, draw, Monza, are you seeing a whiteboard now? Yes, very clearly. Okay, great. So let's say it's a wrapped case, wrapped face. Okay, and again, this minus pi to pi. So what you're seeing, what you're seeing, if I Okay, so this is the interferogram fringes that we just see, right? So, we, for example, if I cut a line, a profile from outside to inside, okay, what you're seeing is something like that. Okay, this is the axis. Okay, so this is A and A prime. Okay, so he is A and A prime. Okay, and then the, the point here is negative pi. The point here is pi. So this is so-called the wrapped phase. So what does the unwrapping does? Unwrapped phase is that it says, oh, I know that if we want to obtain a continuous displacement field, what you're supposed to do is that you're supposed to place this point up to this one and place this point up to this one okay so what it end up giving you is that it's consecutively adding adding this segment up here okay and adding this segment up there so what the unrest phase look like is oops Well, the unwrapped phase look like is a continuous increasing or decreasing field, okay, according to this AA, AA, uh, AA prime profile, okay? And the value will no longer be restricted between negative pi and pi, okay? The value can be, for example, from negative five to like a, you see is, what you see just now is like a, something like 30 something, or 30 ish, right? But still, this unit is in radians, and this is still in radians, correct? So finally, because we don't we don't really read the ground displacement in, in radians, okay? This is not intuitive. So so what you what you did is that so there if you read the scientific literature, usually you see they use this, okay? And this is usually in let's say uh, this is usually phase, okay? So the unit is still in radians. So, and then the displacement is usually using this D, and this can be centimeter or a meter. So what you did from, what we just did is we take the, we calculated the displacement by we multiply this with the radar wavelength, okay, lambda, 
and divide it by the 2 pi range of your original phase uh, value and another factor of 2, which stands for the two-way travel time. All right? And again, back to the most critical issue, whether if you need to add a flip sign or not, okay? Because in SNAP, it always adds this flip sign for you. And I will say this easily cause confusion. Whether if you add, you should add this or not, you really, you really should double check with the ground measurements or, or with a previous example that you know you should flip or you shouldn't flip. Okay, is that clear? The questions? Oh, got the point, great. Are phase two displacement can be used for time series? Example A. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, you mean the the function in SNAP, right? Well, no, because SNAP here, it, they I think they they only deal with individual pairs. Okay, so of course you can do individual pairs and convert them uh, from phase two displacement individually, and finally you output this data and do the time series processing by yourself. Okay. But uh, the, so the phase two displacement is just a very simple function. It doesn't matter whether if you're doing, well, it, it only usually just deal with individual interferograms. And time series analysis is a totally different field, okay? Okay, so I hope I have answered most of the questions. All right, so let's move on. Okay, so now I'm back to the demonstration. Now, let me see. The next topic is do geocoding. Okay. So what does it mean by geocoding? As I mentioned earlier on, uh, the view that you're seeing right now, at the right hand side looks some kind of a cartation. Okay. And there's, there are actually names to describe what we call, this is so-called the radar coordinate, okay? So this x direction means it's the direction along the, uh, along the satellite looking direction. This is the direction we call the range direction. And the y is the direction of the flight direction, okay? So uh, that means because this satellite Okay, so th there is an interesting relationship because uh, usually when we read the ra the radar coordinate values, the the origin of this figure is at the upper left. Okay, so that means here. Oh, by the way, the y direction we call this azimuth. Okay, so this is the range direction and this is the azimuth direction. And you need to remember when you read this value, when you read this figure, the um, Upper left is the origin, which means that this, this range value is zero here, and the azimuth value is also zero here, okay? But then because this flight is flying from south to north, correct? So the first echo it receives is actually at the south, okay? And then this first echo corresponds to the lower az azimuth or lower y-axis in the radar coordinates. Okay. So that means this point is actually at the south. And as the fly is flying this direction, it's acquiring more and more data, and the y-axis is increasing this way okay, in, the, in the real coordinates. But in the radar coordinates, the y-axis is increasing this way, okay? So this part is actually at the north. So south here and north here for an ascending flight, okay? So these are all these, you know, internal transformation. If you really want to interpret this one on the, this image on the radar coordinates. So let's not doing that, okay? Let's just do everything in the geo coordinates. So, the next uh, flow, let me see, where is it? Okay, so session 12. Now let's back to the, uh, the, the 
graph builder. Okay. Oh, and let's open, let's load the sixth geo code. Okay, I already given this to you, remember? Okay. Previously we finished the unwrapping. Okay, now let's move on to the geo code. Okay. okay, in the read, we choose the UNWIFG because remember previously we manually output this, uh, we manually convert the face into displacement using the correct sign that I that I know. Okay, so here is the input terrain correction. Okay. So choose, I think you don't need to choose anything because it should already be there. SRTM one second, okay. And usually we will at least export the incidence angle, okay, because the incidence angle can be useful to you to in, in any later uh, calculation, okay. If you want to do any geophysical modeling. And lay over shadow mask, you can also upper that if necessary. And finally, let's I'll put the UNWF FG Geo. Okay, this is the name I have. You can feel free to change to whatever name you like. Okay, let me hit run. Okay, so some of those. So remember, this is the one that we manually convert from face to displacement using the correct sign I know. Okay, and here I'm opening the geo coded. Here, and then let me change the color. This one. Negative five to twenty five to twenty. All right. Okay, so if I toggle this two, oops. So just zoom in. Let me open again. Okay, so this one is the one in the radar coordinates. And as I told you before, the, uh, the pixels closer to the origin are at the south, and farther from the origin are at the north. So when you geocode it, when you geocode this image, you should see this pattern being upside down. Okay, so that is exactly, oops, this one disappeared. Okay, this one that we're seeing. So these two patterns are, there must be an easy way <laughs> to do this, just I don't know how to show the full view. Okay, but anyway, this is for your information. Uh, and then you may wonder why the view is like uh, doing this, okay? And that's exa exactly because uh, now they are in different coordinate system. This one is in the longitude latitude coordinate system. So right now below, you're seeing long let information right here. But the one without geocoding is in the radar coordinate system. Oh, gosh. Okay, so uh, therefore the long let information you're seeing here is just approximate. Uh, they, they calculate approximate from the metadata embedded in the, in the data, but they are uh, actually still reading the uh, radar pixel values. Okay, so that's why you cannot really overlap. Uh, you cannot really overlay these two images. Okay? So when you toggle between, it's giving you errors. All right. Oh, and one more thing that we should check is the co the coherence. So let's go to the uh, geocoded products and open this coherence. All right, uh, and let me change the color as well. Zero, and the value is always between zero and one. Okay. This one, okay. So if I toggle between uh, this one, 
if I toggle between the the uh, the geo code displacement, so we can check right here. The geo code now I have value in the bands. One is the coherence. One is the displacement value in centimeter that I converted man manually, right? So I move my cursor into this red uh, block, and you know the displacement is somewhere around 15 centimeter. Okay, but the coherence is only 0 0.25. So let's go to the displacement. So that is the part where we have the largest ground displacement. Unfortunately, the coherence is only 0 0.25. And in this part, you have a larger displacements, okay? And those are actually, so you're, you're, you have a larger coherence. And these are the regions where you have cities. Okay, so we can pull out the intensity, okay? This figure looks odd, but these are the bright pixels from the cities, okay? So uh, in this particular, particular case, Okay, for the earthquake that happened in southern Taiwan. Fortunately, in those regions of low coherence, we can still successfully produce this displacement map. However, uh, you may not be always this lucky. And actually, uh, we are not lucky uh, last month for an earthquake that occurred in eastern Taiwan. Okay? Because in eastern Taiwan, if you have a rapidly changing vegetation, for example, if the area is in a farmland, okay, and or in the area is in a rugged mountain region, okay, the coherence can be changing so quickly that you totally lose the coherence. That means most of your area, the coherence, if, if, the, if the coherence is like a lower than 0 0.2, then there is a large chance that you will not be able to produce any meaningful fringes. And even if you manage to unwrap, the unwrapped result may not be reliable. Okay, so in that case, you really need to be very careful uh, to check whether if you obtain any meaningful signal in your unwrapped interferer. Okay, to do so, make sure you always look at the, uh, the this coherence map. Okay, if if the coherence is low, then you need to be extra careful. Okay, so now I am saying that we can export everything to GeoTIFF, okay? And the reason of doing so is that if you like to use um, GIS softwares like ArcGIS or QGIS, uh, the easiest way to, to, for you to share the information or to port the information to the GIS software is a GeoTIFF file, okay? And, uh, I think we also have a graph for that. So let's just finish that. Okay. In the file, reload, 07, okay, SLC graph export, open, okay, so I'm in slide 12.5. Here you read the GO, and make sure when you export, you are only exporting the geocoded results, okay? You, without your coding, you cannot overlay correctly the image into the GIS software. So you read the geocoded products and the band select. You, can, you, you don't need to export everything, but my suggestion is that you always export the coherence and the unwrapped face in centimeter. Okay, so you can, and maybe you would also like to explore the incidence angle, okay, just for your future reference. So finally, you can write, uh, and then I think if we choose three, okay, if we choose all three, they will be put into different bands in the GeoTIFF. So if you don't like your data to be put into different bands, for example, you, you would like to share the data with other people, but you don't want to the, you, want, you don't want people to bother choosing the bands. Then you only choose one, okay? One band in the source, for example, the unwrapped face. And you, when you write it, you just say it is the, uh, for example, displacement. Okay, displacement CM, okay? And you choose one. OK, 
Okay, and as mentioned before, you should also explore the coherence. So you do, you choose the band, the coherence band, and write into coherence. Okay, that's it. That's the end of the interfer interferometric uh, uh, part. Any question? I want to ask when convertitive. Okay, some sometimes value change. Yeah, I think you mentioned that before. So that's exactly what we can do now. Let's go check if the value changes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So just now I converted GeoTIFF, which is the QGIS. If you have QGIS, you can also do that with me. Okay. Even though I didn't put that into the software, uh, into the into the. Uh, the PPP, okay? So go to raster, just now I click this one, okay? Add the layer, okay? Open the data source manager. And in the raster, I just choose uh, the place where I store the data, okay? The SAR course project, Taiwan. Now you see coherence and displacement in CM. So let me open the displacement in CM. Yeah. All right, so here we have it. And let me change the color a bit. Symbology. Uh, by the way, I may be wrong too quick. You right click on this layer, choose properties. Okay. And in the property, go to symbology tab. In the symbology tab, you choose single band, pseudo color. Okay? And below, you can choose whatever color you like. Let's do rainbow. Okay? And just for the figure to look more similar to what we saw just now in Snap, I would like to ch manually change the min and max to minus 5 and 20. Okay? Okay. So here's what I have. And because we want to compare the values. Okay, let's confirm if the value have changed, has changed. You can click on this I, which is to identify features. Okay, and let me click on the needle, for example, right here, and the value is 15. And let's come back to what we have just now in the, the, main, the, the one. Okay, the the um, the displacement in centimeter. Okay, let's check the value in here. Is actually also around fifteen. So, what I think is that uh, so Connie, could could it be that the value that you're seeing, the value difference that you're seeing due to um, the phase two display, dis displacement, or are you really seeing a change of value between? files in SNAP and files in GeoTIFF. Because to me, the value seems to be quite similar, unless you're talking about very, very minor difference. Okay, so no problem, right? Okay, so if you follow the flow, and if you know what you're doing, okay, especially be very super cautious about the sign flip, the sign flipping, in the uh, so-called the phase two displacement function in SNAP, okay? If you're careful enough, then you're supposed to see very similar values, okay? All right, I hope you have no further questions, and these are just very basic introduction to a single interferogram, okay? And if you are really aiming to do something fancy, okay, such as like a time series analysis, okay, uh, I have to say that's, uh, you know, probably another like a three to five day lecture <laughs> because it, 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 it's more complicated than uh, producing a single interferogram. Okay, so that's impossible to cover within, uh, you know, a single uh, session in this short course. All right. Okay, so if there is no uh, further questions, then we will move on to another topic. Okay, I hope you're still with me, which is the topic about the uh, flood mapping.
Okay. Uh, I think flow mapping is actually easier, okay, more straightforward, and it can be very useful, especially uh, some of you, uh, your country may be, to some of you, your country may uh, suffer, especially countries in Southeast Asia may suffer uh, floods due to uh, typhoons or, you know, torrential rains, okay. And if you are being re re requested to create a rapid flood mapping, uh, I have to say SAR can be uh, even more powerful than optical image. Of course, there's one limitation, which is that you need to have the satellite overpasses, okay? Because it does not necessarily mean when the flood happens, you will have satellite overpasses, okay? But of course, there are many international organizations uh, that is already coordinating different uh, uh, satellite provider, image providers to help pre-define or to help task the satellites before uh, the flood occurs. So that when it really happens, you will have a, a readily available star image to carry out flood mapping, okay? So if some of you know, uh, the name of such organization is called the Sentinel Asia, okay? The Sentinel is the same Sentinel as the name of the satellite, okay? Uh, Asia. Sentinel Asia, and is actually an, organiza uh, an organization coordinated by JAXA, which is the, the, which is the space agency in Japan. Okay? So if you are curious, you can Google Sentinel Asia, and you will see a complete list of events that JAXA has helped coordinate the tasking of satellites. All right, so let me just uh, continue with the flood mapping. Uh, me check the slides. Okay, so to start with, oops, okay, and the, the uh, event that we're going to look at is the uh, flood that occurred in Pakistan uh, this August. All right, so again, so uh, go to uh, slide 1.1. We go to the graph builder and the, we would like to load the, if you still remember, you save that. Here is a GRD graph, crop Hokkaido, okay? This one, let's open. Okay, so you should have this flow on the window ready. Go to slide 1.2. However, here I'm going to do something different, okay? Because previously when I uh, taught the Hokkaido example, remember the example was about landslide. Uh, the main purpose was to teach you how to build the graph in this tool, okay? So I didn't bother to go into more details. But now, since I assume that you already know how this graph is being built, then we would like to add modification to an existing flow. Okay, so let's, so let me delete and delete. I deleted the last two flow, the last two box, and I want to add something, code. Let's go to radar. And it's in speckle filtering and speckle filter. So let me add that. And you, you need to remember that for the flow to work properly, uh, you just just like what I did before, you need to delete the following the, the later boxes and in order to insert a new box. Okay, and then for the flow to work smoothly, okay, you need to delete the later boxes first. So I include this one and I add back all those uh, previous geometric terrain correction, terrain correction. Okay. And finally, right. Okay. And connect, 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 connect. Okay. 
So now, done. Start from the breathe. So this one, we would like to read the Pakistan. Oops, sorry. Right, the project in the data. Okay, Pakistan. So I have downloaded two things. Okay, one is in the end of August. One is in January, early January. Okay, so by comparing these two, it's easier for you to visualize uh, what what is the extent of the flood. So let me process the earlier, the first image, the pre-event image first. So, and then in the subset, again, you will need to come to this window. Okay, use your middle wheel to move out. Use your Hmm. Hmm. My white, my, my right mouse key is not moving properly. <laughs> this is very annoying. Yeah, this can happen. Somehow it's not moving. Delete. Okay. Oh, you probably need to zoom in slightly more <laughs> in order to be able to move your uh, to move your map. Okay. All right. So I know my image is covering this part of Pakistan. Okay. So let me come to this part and draw only a small rectangle, okay? This is for the purpose of the demonstration. Okay. So just like in slide 1.5, I'm going to use my right key to drag and create a polygon, okay, like that. Okay, apply orbit, okay, just the same. Calibration. Basically the same, don't need to do anything, do any changes. Okay, thermal noise removal, if you still remember, we have these two calibrations, just keep them. Okay, now here comes to the speckle filter. Okay, actually speckle filter is a very um, critical part in whatever change detection you are doing with, from the uh, SAR intensity image, okay, because um, the main reason is because due to you know the the speckle actually comes uh, comes from a lot of uh, uh, tiny reflectors within a single resolution cell. Okay, so there just as a as a raw image, it always contains speckle. Okay, even if you can you you can conduct the thermal noise calibration, the radiometric calibration, there there are still always speckles, and these speckles are usually very bright spots in your data and it can hinder or it can uh, bias the detection of the actual signals. So usually we need to carry out some kind of a speckle noise attenuation. And the most commonly adopted method is something called the Lee filter, okay, like the one that I'm showing here, the Lee. But there are many other methods you can try, but the default is always Lee. And if you check the reference paper, uh, if you ch check scientific reference, still a lot of people recommend Lee. And I think there are some other using, uh, there's the original Lee, okay? And there are uh, Frost, okay? This is also another filter that I saw, that I also, that I also saw in papers. But anyway, let's just try the Lee Sigma. Okay? And if you really want to do some, you know, small projects, feel free to try all these different speckle attenuation filters, okay, and you can evaluate how they perform in your in your project. Another important uh, parameter that you should check is the window size, okay, because the larger the window size, 
the better, of course, the attenuation effects. But, but at the same time, it tend to blur your the, the edges in your images. Okay, so if you have very large window, at the end you will find a lot of the features in your such as the boundary of the houses become blurry. So you you need to be careful with the with the size of the window. Of course, there are also papers discussing what's the optimal window size, but I like to say this is actually kind of uh, empirical. <laughs> it varies from place to place depending on the land cover type in the image. Okay, so let's let's just keep with the default. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I say just keep with the default. Okay, so the two uh, key parameters, also something you can try, is that different filter type. That's one and the window size, that's another. Okay, and for the right, okay. oh sorry, the terrain correction, terrain correction, okay. Oh, by the way, I think at some point, I click, I probably click onto the VV band, so the output here only contains VV. Uh, let's see, where did that happen? Oh, here, you see? I accidentally click onto the VV. Okay, I unclick that. Okay, now it has both polarizations because uh, that's another thing you can check, which is that how how do different polarization affect the efficiency of your uh, ch change detection? Okay, because uh, different polarized waves actually have different sensitivities to waters, so uh, that's something you can also explore by yourself. Okay. Filter. Why there's only VV? But anyway, let's just continue on. All right. And again, for the output, we also always like to have the incidence angle, uh, the local incidence angle, and the layover shadow mask. That's always my default. Finally, right. Let's do pre. So as mentioned in slide 1.8, pre field 7 times 7. Okay. And in the project, change to Pakistan. Okay. Pakistan. And run. Overwrite, yes. Okay, so if your area is small enough, it should be fairly quick. If you have any question, you can ask now. Uh, let's see. Okay, some questions. Teach us the time series interferometry. Okay, that may be something you can. You can ask TSU in the future. <laughs> okay, because that's a big, big topic. How to compare different fields of performance using a parameter instead of just visual? Which parameter can be checked? Okay, that's a very good question. Okay. Unfortunately, there is no absolute answer. The only answer or the only way to check is that you need to have a validation data set. Okay, when we say validation data set, Usually, we say, uh, for example, you obtain um, flood, you know, the extent of the flood from, for example, uh, optical images acquired about the same time. And you can imagine this is actually quite difficult because you need to have optical image without cloud covers, right? And acquired about at the same time with a star image. So that's not really very something very common. <laughs> uh, and therefore, usually we refer to some uh, famous examples, okay, in flood. And for example, if you are doing landslide study, there are also some famous examples of landslides, okay, that happen to acquire such precious data sets and allow you to evaluate what should be the best filter window size or the filter type you should use. In your data okay so the only way is do validation so search one one key issue about search engine de detection is that you always need to have something to validate with otherwise it's very difficult to convince people scientifically right but of course if you're only talking about you know uh, operations then what I suggest is that you take the parameter from some published data, okay? 
And then you can say, we adopt the parameters from this and that paper. At least there is a reference regarding why you, you, are, using the, you are using the parameter. Okay, it's better than nothing. Okay, so I hope I answer your question, Abhishek. Okay, the next question, how can we assess which is the best filter? Okay, so the same question, okay, Mark? And all oh, my question you also must say, ah, yes, okay, great. All right, so at the same time, we're finished. So let's look at the results. Let's just put this aside. And, okay, sigma VV. Okay, so here we go. Right, that's the small area that we crop out for our analysis. And just for the sake of saving time, I would just you know go back here and choose the second image. Okay, and you basically can skip everything because you want to keep everything the same. And for the right, we just change it to post. Okay, filter field seven by seven. All right, and the run. Okay, hope you're with me. So that's the session one. Let me see if we have more questions. Okay, so far so good. Computing REST data. Yeah, you may find that um, to process the data on your local PC sometimes can be very um, can be very uh, inefficient. <laughs> like uh, like in my case, because I only have two cores on my PC. Okay, on the laptop I'm working on. So actually, uh, if I slightly enlarge the area of interest. Is going to take a long time. Okay, so actually, so I actually personally use Snap for all my change detection related processing. Okay, but then uh, the way is that you form the the graph. Okay, the graph, for example, like this one we have. Okay, you def you design the graph ready, and of course you save it into an XML file, XML file, and then in your workstation, okay? And of course, when we say workstation, we usually say it's a Linux platform, right? Uh, in your workstation and your work, because my workstation come with many, many cores, okay? So in your workstation, you can um, use other languages. For example, in my case, I use Python, okay? Use Python to uh, parallelize your processing flow. Okay, and to make the best use of your computing resources. So you, as long as you install, uh, you, you install Snap, because Snap is a cross-platform software. So you can also install Snap in your workstation, in the Linux operation system. And once you have it, it automatically can, you can, uh, can uh, utilize all the computing resources on Linux. Okay. So you design the workflow quickly in your laptop, and you send it over to your workstation, okay? And use Python to write the data ingestion and, and uh, so one way is to use Python to do data ingestion and to export the results. Alternatively, you can also oh, just open your, um, this graph, right? In the Linux version of Snap, and then you can run the whole area. You don't need to only work on a small area, okay? So this way, it will significantly speed up your workflow. Okay. So here we have the post. Okay, let me open that. All right. So you are seeing if I just visually click between these two images. Okay. What you're seeing is a significant decrease of the radar intensity, right? This is the before image in January. This is the after image in the end of August. Okay, so 
I think this could have already convinced you that SAR image can see the flood very easily. May I see a demo of Linux uh, without processing? Well, probably not this time. <laughs> we, are, we are already running out of time. <laughs> okay, so hope we'll have a chance in the future, all right? Okay, and uh, so the reason is very simple. Okay, uh, maybe I should just quickly share my screen again. Oops, do I share, unshare. Mm. Okay, and I want to share my screen here. Share screen. Mm. Okay, so back to the sketch. Okay, so why we are seeing things like this, okay, in the flood case. So this is a satellite, right? Okay, okay, let's just stick with blue. Okay, here's our little satellite. Okay, so imagine you are at a, at a dry ground, right? So we know what the star sees is the so-called backscattering because as you can imagine when you, when you send out, when you transmit the, the radio wave, the microwave, part of the energy will be doing forward scattering, correct? And you are relying on this tiny, well, sometimes tiny, sometimes big backward scattering in, in the, direct, in the direction of the satellite to, to see what's happening on the ground. Okay, so this is in a dry condition. So what's happening when, when the, the ground is being flooded? Okay, so the same satellite, it passes at a second date and you are seeing it's all flooded on the, on the ground surface, right? So the main difference is that when, when it's flooded, okay, this ground surface becomes a, a very smooth surface, right? When it becomes smooth, it, it, it becomes something similar to a mirror. Okay. So when the satellite transmit, when the SAR system transmit energy, and when it hits this smooth surface, the majority of the energy will be doing forward scattering. Okay. So there will be very, very little, okay, coming back to the satellite. All right. So that means if you are dry, you're at least seeing something from the ground, but when it's wet, then you receive very little. And that's why you're having all these dark pixels when it's flooding, okay? All right, so this is the simple uh, basics about why you're seeing all dark pixels. Okay. All right, so back to this view. So now we know we are already, okay, so if you are, oh, we have a question. What are the different sigma and gamma on snap? Oh, okay, so sigma and gamma are just different, uh, different type of N uh, RCS. If you still remember from Professor Allen Tai's talk, normalize the radar cross section, okay. So sigma and the gamma are different approaches of normalizing the radar energy, okay? So there are actually some papers discussing the difference and uh, which one is better for change detection purposes. And in general, uh, because gamma, when you normalize over gamma, as far as I remember, it seems to take into account the effects of the local topography, okay? Whereas sigma is more like uh, taking into account of uh, you know uh, some some kind of a, a uniform area uh, some kind of area associated with the ellipse ellipsoid okay so they tend to provide different effects uh, when you finally see the see the uh, result okay so here I'm not taking to the the local topography because when we are talking about flood you can imagine most of the flooded area are relatively flat. But if you are talking about landslides, okay, and if you are talking about detecting the landslides in SAR, then you will see things very differently in gamma and in sigma, okay? All right, so now let's back to the PPT, oh, not this one, 
is my PPT. Okay. Okay. So now next we need to do we need to align the images again. Okay. Because if you still remember previously in the Hokkaido case, okay, when these two images are produced separately, the pixel boundaries are not really aligned, and that will uh, that will cause problems if we want to do advanced data processing, okay, or advanced analysis uh, based on the two images. Okay, so so usually we would like to do a um, uh, some kind of a, a data alignment. Okay, so here it, here it is, slide 2.1, go to raster and uh, geometric and uh, projection. Yes. Okay, so let's just project the maybe the pre to the pro. Okay, to the pre to the post. Okay, okay. Oh, hold on. I see. I do post to the pre. Well, it doesn't really matter. Okay. All right, so the post 7.7 .7 we projected. Okay, I do realigned. Okay, the same project location. Okay, and then in the next tab, we need to use the CRS from the pre. Okay, this is the trick. Run. Okay. Close. Okay, so now we have a project the aligned image. So let me close this one and open the aligned version. Okay, and if you still remember how we toggle, okay, come here. So I'm in the post and the aligned version. Okay, and then we have this uh, products, this band from product three. So let's add the image of band. Okay. We want to add something to this layer. We want the uh, pre, okay. Finish. All right. So this one is pre, and this one is post. And let me zoom in to one of the. Okay. So let me toggle. Oh, okay. So not a bit. All right. So you see. So this, oops, this whole field, okay, I'm not sure if it's a petty field or if, if it's something else, it's probably something else, okay? But anyway, this field is totally flooded, okay? So that's why it becomes so dark, okay? So previously you can see all these patterns, okay? All the rows, small rows in, inside the field, but then now it just got severely inundated, okay? So that's why the, the August, Flood, the flood in August, uh, sorry, the flood in Pakistan this August has, has attracted so much international attention because the, the huge area is being flooded. Okay, and you can see them very clearly, okay, including these tiny patches, okay, these tiny patches in the, in the, in the field. All right, so next we're going to do something, okay, this is to estimate the the area, the total area of the flooded uh, region. Okay, so uh, and we want to do it more um, slightly more accurately because so when I say slightly more accurately because uh, we want to use both the information from the pre image, which is this one and also the information from the post image. We want to use both to, to generate some kind of uh, index map, okay? And we use, we use this index information to estimate w which are the pixels that represent the, um, the flooded area, okay? Of course, you can say, no, that, that, that seems to be too bothering. I only want to use, you know, only the post event image to do the flood estimation. Sure, you can do that, but of course you face some kind of uh, ambiguity because naturally there are places that are dark, right? So these are naturally dark areas. And then they also appear dark after the flood. So if you have only one image, which is the image after the flood, how are you supposed to know whether if these pixels are flooded or not? 
right? But if you compare before and after, then you probably have a better idea which are the originally dark pixels and which are the dark pixels caused by the flood. Okay, all right. So the following flow is to do this. Uh, the first one, okay, so let's do three, uh, session three, band merging. We need to merge these two bands into the same product. Uh, sorry, in, yeah, into the same product in order to do the, the next uh, analysis. So let's, uh, according to slide 3.1, we need to load uh, these blocks. So let me do that. Uh, I have a read and I want to do raster data conversion. Okay, all right. And then we like to do things in DB, okay? Uh, I think Professor Tsai also mentioned what's in DB and I also mentioned previously, okay? So DB is in a log scale, it's not in a linear scale. And we like to see uh, things in log scale because it allows you to have a, a, a better separation in the low amplitude side of the image. Okay, add, uh, you could read. Okay, so these are for the two, two bands, okay, the pre-image and the post-image. Add rest. Data conversion. <clears throat> Okay, we have them, and we want to merge band. It's in raster merge band. Okay, so the logic is clear. Combine them, we connect them. Okay, all right, and then now we read. Okay, so this is pre and linear to, um, okay, maybe read to first, read to is the post realigned, okay? Don't choose the wrong one. Otherwise, when you do the later calculation, uh, the pixels are, if the pixels are not properly aligned, you may face some problems. Okay, and linear to DB, this one, you just keep the default. Okay, linear to DB2, you just keep the default. And merge, okay, also keep the default. Okay, so it's quite straightforward. Finally, right? So I think I called it merge DB, merge DB. And then make sure you save it. So we save, okay. And I said band merge DB. Yeah, this one, band merge DB. Just save, yes, and run. Yes. Okay. That's it. Okay, so if we look at this new product in the bands, you are supposed to see both, okay? So this is the first, which is re representing the first date in January, and this is the second, okay? Which is rep representing the second date, okay? And they are properly aligned. So this allows us to do uh, uh, the, ses the next session, which is to obtain some kind of flood proxy map, okay? And again, this flood proxy map is usually used for um, has an assessment purpose or for a policy making purpose, okay? So it will be very useful if people ask you, oh, then how do you know what's the total area of the flood, okay? Then you can use this proxy map to do the estimation. Okay, so next we have this product ready. Let's prepare the graph. So again, go to the graph builder, okay? And we need to do some band math. Delete the last one. Start from beginning. The band math is in raster and math. Okay, this is actually a very useful tool. Band math and write. Okay, and connect them. Okay. 
OK. And the read, we just do merge DB. OK, you already pick for you. Next, we want to calculate the proxy. OK, so in the slide 4.3, you are seeing I have something already there. Uh, maybe let me do sequentially. So let me change the band name. It's called flood lower than 10. OK, so what does that mean? Let's go to edit expression. OK, now you have it. So we know this DB2 represents the change, the decrease, the, the flooded event, right? And the intensity for the flood tend to increase. And so we want to compare with the dry period, which is this one, OK? So we compare their difference. And of course, these two are in dBs, right? OK, we add a parentheses. So I would like to say, OK, if the intensity, de intensity decrease is more, is more negative than 10 dB, OK, the change, the decrease of intensity is more than 10 dB, then I will call it a flooded pixel. OK, so that's just the logic. And you may say, wait a minute, the, this threshold, negative 10, seems to be very arbitrary. Yes, it is very arbitrary at this moment. Okay? Of course, there are many uh, very sophisticated algorithms for you to have a more robust uh, estimation of the flooded pixel. But they all come from this very original idea, which is that at some point, there need to be a good cut that allows you to separate the flooded versus the non-flooded pixel. And of course, the different algorithms, they use different approaches to find this good cut, OK? So for now, we're, on, we're just going to use a single threshold, which is negative 10. And if you're interested in, using a, in having a small project, feel free to modify this value and see, and you can judge which one you think is more um, reasonable, OK? So now we have this. And uh, slide 4.3, uh, uh, <laughs> next, the second page actually explain <clears throat> a little bit of the mathematic foundation for <clears throat> or the mathematic origin of this equation, but I'm not going to go through the details. Feel free to read it by yourself, OK, on page 28. <clears throat> OK, so finally we write out, we say, OK, so we always want to keep track of what parameter we use. So we say it's some kind of flood proxy map. And we use filter 7 by 7. OK, so feel free to have a different version. And we have a threshold lower than negative 10. OK, so that's what these uh, letters mean. They run. All right, and make sure you save it. Save. Oh, so I can say my graph at PM. OK, save. OK, so let's check where are the maps. Oh, sorry, where are the floods? Here you go. So now, if you go to pixel value and move your cursor, you only, what's left is just 1 and 0. OK, so it's a logical uh, equation. When the pixel, the, the pixel value decreases more than 10 dBs, it will become 1. That means it, it detects the flooded area. And all the others are not non-flooded. Okay? So even in the originally dark region, okay, so this area, some of them are dark originally, okay, you will, it will still allow you to detect where are the flooded areas. OK, so now ne what's next is that I'm going to export this one. OK, so go to band, sorry, go to raster and uh, data conversion. OK, so let me just follow. Uh, session 5 over overlay on Google map. OK. <clears throat> So I'm not pretty sure if I should really go through them, but just in case that you don't know how to do it, uh, because in QGIS, you can easily have access to Google Satellite. Okay, So for example, here, I'm having the Google Satellite directly 
on my QGIS. So this allow me very quick access uh, to actually not just Google Satellite, okay, you can also have access to OpenStreetMap. Okay, so that's what, what I like about QGIS. Uh, as far as I know, you can also do that in ArcGIS, but it, it is not this uh, simple and straightforward. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip session five for now because it's just, you know, go through the step-by-step uh, -step, uh, how you can add the Google Satellite and the, the OpenStreetMap into your QGIS. If you don't know how to do that now yet, uh, just follow the steps, okay? And uh, let me see. So back to this flood map. I'll just quickly open, use the previous uh, graph I have, <coughs> which is to export. Remember, we have this SLC graph export, but we can still use it now. Okay, so we can choose the uh, FPM okay. and select just that one. All right, I will just call this time. Mm. Okay, and export into a GeoTIFF, just like what we did before. Mm. Okay, so now in session 5.1, Let me add the raster, okay, and choose, go to project and Pakistan, choose the flood mapping, the, the TIFF file, okay, FPM 77, lower than negative 10, open. But you may find, oh, where, where is it? Okay, because it's in Pakistan and we're still in Taiwan. So uh, highlight this layer, right click and choose zoom to layer. There you go. Okay. And we don't really like this uh, zero values. Zero values means it's dry. So let me double click. And in transparency, you set additional no data value to zero. Okay, apply. Okay, so here they are, they disappear. And the color is dark, is black, that's not really what we want. Okay, so you can choose palleted unique value. Okay, so that means it's going to find out the unique values in the raster. And because we only have zero and one in the raster, that will make this uh, really easy. Okay, and let's change, double click and change the color to something like a light blue. Okay, here you go. Okay, now you have already obtained your flood maps and you can overlay them on the Google Satellite. Okay, that easily allows you estimate, uh, visualize and even produce reports okay, for your work or even carry out any advanced analysis. So I think I have already come to the last session, okay. which is uh, if, if you don't know how to, okay, or if you're not familiar with other advanced uh, analysis tool, okay, for example, I like to use MATLAB, and then I can, you know, import this GOT file into MATLAB and do all the advanced calculation there. But if you don't know how to use it, it's okay, you can still do some very simple analysis in QGIS, okay? Of course, one way is there's a raster, raster calculator right here, okay? You can do some kind of raster calculation using this tool, okay? But this, uh, today I'm going to, what I'm talking about is to calculate the total flood area, okay? In this, in this map, okay, zoom to layer. So I want to know inside this region, how much is flooded? How, what is the area that's flooded? So now to do so, let's go to processing, okay, and go to toolbox. Now you have this toolbox, and then in the toolbox, you just search for unit, okay. And in the raster analysis, 
there is a rest layer unique values report. It's very easy, okay? Because remember, in this rest file, since it's a flood proxy map, we only have zero and ones. So double click, choose this FPM file, okay? Choose band one, okay? And you, you don't need to save anything because uh, by default everything will be saved will be in memory, okay? So it's not going to really occupy your disk space. So run. Okay, so once it's done, automatically you should have a result viewer, okay? And actually it's just a, a text report. So let's double click. And you should go directly using your web browser, okay? And it will tell you how much, how many pixels are being flooded, right? So you say there are, the total number of pixels is this one plus this one, and among them, this, this many pixels are being flooded. It calculates the area in degrees, but you can easily convert this into, uh, for example, square kilometer, because you know that by default, each uh, GRD, the Sentinel-1 GRD file, the pixel size is 10 meters by 10 meters, okay? So that means each pixel is 100 square meters. So you just multiply this value by 100, then you get a flooded area. All right, so that's the end for the demonstration. Uh, let me see if any question. Okay, so there's no more question. Is there less chance to ask? Otherwise, I'm going to move on with a, a short talk. <laughs> any question? Okay, so if not, I will just continue okay, to talk about slightly more advanced, which is um, not really that, it's not very basic, but I think you should be able to understand since you already follow me through the demonstration, okay? So um, if you still remember, um, just now we talk about, well, we can uh, search for the flooded area by checking where are the locations that have a decreased amplitude or decreased intensity compared to the dry period, right? And uh, uh, we also know that you, you can use an arbitrary cut, for example, negative 10, BD, 10 dB, use an arbitrary cut, you can get some kind of a flood proxy map. But these doesn't seem to be very robust. Of course, it can give you some kind of a, a first hand information and uh, uh, like a fr the, the level one information, okay? But if you go to the details, some of the details may be wrong, okay? And we always say that, uh, you know, the details are where the demons are. <laughs> so uh, what are the details, okay? What are the things that the, the uh, scientific community is working on, okay? So that's what this talk is about. The details is, about the floods in urban areas, okay? Because, because just now we mentioned, if you have an open area, okay, that, that is flooded, then when, when the radar wave comes, it will, be, it will go through forward scattering. So the intensity back, or the energy back into the satellite become uh, smaller compared to the dry period. However, if you are in an urban area, it's a different story, okay, because if you have a house, if you have a house like that, and you know when the radar wave comes, uh, of course there will be a shadow that's being blocked by the house, but in front of the house, you will see layover, which means that the wave will bounce twice, okay, within, within this zone, okay, from here to here. So if the the radar wave is here, it will bounce here and comes back. This is called a uh, double bounce, or multi even sometimes it can be even multi bounce. Okay. And then when it's flooded, okay, so you can ignore all this text, these are just you know, some information. But when, when, when the area is flooded, okay, it tends to in increase the intensity because 
the, the flat surface of the water will enhance the, the forest scattering in this segment. And then at the end, the increased intensity that you see in the satellite image, in the, in the, in the star image. Okay. So that caused all the problems, such as like a, actually in those area, in, in the method that I just told you, okay, use a, a cut about the decrease intensity, will miss all the pixels in the urban area. Okay. And then you may say, oh, that's easy. Then let's just say uh, we want to add another cut that shows intensity increase. Okay. But this is actually quite difficult because uh, there are many factors that can, that can lead to intensity increase, not just the, the so-called the double bounce effect. Okay. So such as uh, when, you're, when your crop, okay, imagine you are in, a, in the field, when your crop grow tall, or when your crop, the leaves grow bigger, or the crowns grow bigger, it also increases the intensity. Okay. And another effect is what we call the soil moisture. Okay. When you're, and actually radar wave is very sensitive to soil moisture changes. So if your soil moisture increase, then you will also see brighter uh, uh, return wave in your, in your uh, star image. Okay. So what we care is that, because we know uh, the, the floods in the urban area is really what, we, what most people care about. So how to more accurately detect the flood in the urban area is actually the main focus of what the change detection community is working on right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ignore all these details, but uh, basically what we are doing, one of the approach that we propose is that we incorporate all the information backward in time. Okay, so each of these dots represents a, the so this figure, for example, okay, this curve come from the same pixel on the, on the surface, but at different time, okay? So we actually process many, many uh, star images using SNAP, okay? So SNAP can be very useful in this case, but you need to have a powerful computer, okay? You, you, you process all the images, you align them properly, okay? And then you check the information, the, the time series of the intensity and then you will realize that the, the, some, at different land cover types, some of the intensity variation very, very, can be very strong. Okay. Some of the variation is relatively stable. For example, in the vegetation, in the case of vegetation, we know there are variations. But the variation is not very um, significant. But you see in the dry land, okay, this, uh, this uh, orange line, the variation can be very strong. And the reason is, as I mentioned before, when it's dry land, the intensity can significantly increase when the, the moisture changes, okay? So when you have this kind of information in time, you actually have the information of the pixels statistics, okay? So this is what we did, we just plot how they look like, how these different points, when we take these points and plot the histogram, then we know in, in the history, in, in the history of the, within this time span, how the intensity varies. It can be very, very within a very small range, or it can vary in a large range, okay? And through some kind of a statistical uh, operation, we can make use of the time series standard deviation, okay, the standard deviation of this uh, time series and the mean of the time series and generate a value which is called the z-score. That is actually uh, better than compared to what we did just before, which is to do the, uh, the post minus pre method, okay, because this approach takes into account of the uh, statistical variation that is seen in this particular pixel, okay? So that's the basic idea of how you can, uh, one of the, one, one way you can utilize the time series information in a, a change detection case. Okay, I'll just skip all these details because it later we later incorporate a lot of more <laughs> um, 
so called the Bayesian. Okay, it sounds fancy, but it's actually it's just to calculate the probability. Okay, so then these are just the um, uh, results where it detects the regions that you see the intensity decrease from a, a statistically robust point of view. Okay, in the same time you can and then it, it calculates the probability actually. Okay, so it's no longer a a sharp cut between zero and one, flooded or non flooded, but it actually contains some kind of probability. All right. So it can also allow you to detect the amplitude increase again with some probability. And of course you can finally determine where you want to use the uh, cut of probability to generate the flood proxy map. Of course usually we use point zero. Oh, sorry, point five. Okay, fifty percent. But anyway, as you can imagine, if most of the flooded pixels are probably uh, the contains probability close to one. All right. So, and these are just some kind of automatic. Uh, so previously, when we are conducting this one, we do some kind of a manual work. But later, we managed to do some kind of automatic detection uh, by developing an algorithm called the Goring split based approach. But anyway, it's just um, uh, automatic way and more robust way to tell what are the uh, the best uh, statistical uh, operation on the pixels. Ignore all this. Okay. So previously we were you you were seeing an area right here, but uh, in this later work we extend to the whole region. Okay, a large area, and you can see it actually allows us to detect the flood under the vegetation. Okay, so this red area. And blue is the open water flood. Okay, so I'll end here. So uh, we also use this method to, to detect the, uh, another flood in Bangladesh in 2019. And you can see uh, by using SNAP and also by using uh, Sentinel-1 GRD data, you can very quickly produce a large area flood mapping. So you can see we use many, many frames. Okay, and we use the method I just described you can detect the intensity increase and the intensity decrease. But this figure tells you that um, in, in many cases, actually, uh, the flood with intensity decrease, which means the open area flood, is still the most dominating effects. Okay? So if you don't really, uh, if your focus is not really about the urban flood, but you are focusing on in general, how big is the flood area, I would say that being able to detect the floods with intensity decrease will give you the you know the first order image about what's happening on the ground. Okay, and the uh, urban flood is probably only a small fraction compared to the big picture. All right, so that's the end of the flood mapping session. Uh, I hope you have learned something from this, and if you have any question, uh, feel free to raise now. Okay, Monza, I'll give back to you. Oh, I see a question. Sorry, Mary, see a little demo of Snapchat Linux. Uh, uh, pr probably not. Now. <laughs> it's already it's already six. Do you really want to stay that late? <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, next time <laughs> I'll think about how to do that. <laughs> I mean, I'll think about how to present that in a nice and easy way for you to understand. Okay. Okay, any more question? Well, thank you, Abhishek. All right, Monza, your turn. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lin. And yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. No problem, no problem, my pleasure. Thank you.